today's scripture reading is from Matthew 5, verse 13 to verse 16. Uh, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt should lose its taste, how can it be made salty? It's no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand, and it gives light for all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, church. My name is Lesejo, and I have the privilege of serving the body of Christ through Fellowship City as elder and pastor. This morning, I have the privilege of sharing the word of God with you. This morning, we start a mini-series titled Elections. It is uh, May 5 and 24 days to the elections on May 29. Is elections a conversation for the church? Is politics relevant? For the church? Should we not separate church and state? Does what I do on the 29th of May matter? Does the Bible tell me who I should be voting for? Is abstaining from voting okay? We will try to answer these questions from the Bible's perspective over the next two weeks, this week and next week, as we uh, work through this mini series. So, coming from Eat and Run, which was yesterday, ended about 9 p.m. I'm surprised I didn't hear any woohoos here. Um, so coming from Eat and Run, I believe it is okay for me to show you a picture of food as I demonstrate my point this morning. This is an image of Kobe beef. This is a type of Wagyu beef. However, this is the top of the variations of Wagyu. Uh, Kobe beef is known for its exceptional marbling and flavor. Um, we did not serve Kobe beef yesterday. <laughs> but this stands out from all the types of beef within its category, within its class. It has a buttery rich flavor, a melt in your mouth kind of flavor as well. This is the 325i, commonly known as the Gusheshe. This is a BMW, but this BMW stands above the others. It is well known, it has both the performance and the looks if you are to drive one, you would feel the difference. Uh, I would know I have driven one. <laughs> it, it gives you that bit of a kid's smile, um, makes you think of how different it feels to other BMWs. This morning we will see that as Christians, we are different. We have a different identity, and that identity is what should enable us to stand out as we engage culture. As we stand out, people should notice, and people should give glory to God. I know that as a transcultural church, we have people from different walks of life. Some people sitting here are not able to vote on the 29th of May, but this message is for all people. We always speak about the Bible being useful for all aspects of life. This morning, we see how the Bible gives perspective on how we ought to live, how we ought to view government, and in turn, elections. If you're not a South African, this message also relates to you, how you ought to view your government or how you ought to view government in general how you ought to view voting, how you ought to view elections in the context that you're from or in the context that you are in now. If you thought what you would hear today is who to vote for or which of the 52 parties would win the election, then I'm afraid you will leave disappointed. What we will focus on today is should we vote? Is this important? To answer these questions, we need to answer three questions and three points from this morning. Who are we? What are we called to? Why do we participate in the elections and broader community spaces? So who are we? What are we called to? Why do we participate in elections and broader community spaces? Let me pray for us. Lord, we thank you that we can gather as your people. We can praise and worship you. We can meet and encounter you through fellowship, through praise, and now through word. I pray that you would speak through my vocal cords this morning, that your people would hear your voice speaking. Would you clear our hearts and minds to hear your voice, to hear you? 
the Holy Spirit be at work, both convicting and encouraging us and pointing us to the cross of Christ. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew 5 is the start, is the start of what is called the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus gave his most well-known teaching and one of history's most famous speeches through the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus delivers his teaching, which 2,000 plus years later is still relevant and meaningful to life. Jesus emphasizes humility, love, forgiveness, and generosity through the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount includes radical and upside-down ways of culture and life, the way that we ought to view culture, the way we ought to view life, in an upside down or radical way is what we see in the Sermon on the Mount. Something like love your enemies. Something like pray for people who persecute you. So Jesus stands on a, a large hill, speaks to Jews as his primary audience who have been oppressed by Rome, bullied and taxed into poverty by the rulers of the day. So things aren't going well necessarily for the people within that moment of time. But Jesus has a message for them, a message for all of life. So our first point, who are we? The Jews are God's chosen people. So how does this message relate to us? In Genesis, we see the start of the Bible story. Creation happens through God speaking. God created Adam and Eve to be in perfect relationship with him. Genesis 3, the fall happens. Sin enters the world and separates God from his people. Throughout the Old Testament, we see God's people struggling to be faithful, living in sin and in need for a Savior, struggling with idolatry. The Savior is prophesied by prophets in the Old Testament to be to the Messiah, the one who is to come, the final sacrifice for sins that would quench the wrath of God. The Savior would come from the line or the lineage of Abraham who is credited with righteousness. Through Abraham being blessed, those who believe in Jesus, who are descendants of Abraham, are therefore blessed and therefore adopted and part of God's chosen people. So if you know Jesus as Lord and Savior, if you believe Jesus died for your sins, then you too are adopted into his family and are part of his chosen people. Then Jesus here is speaking to you as well when he speaks about how we ought to view and engage life. This message is for Christians, for those who follow and live in obedience to Christ. So what are we called to? In Matthew 5, Jesus has started his ministry. He's teaching, healing, and forgiving sins. Jesus gives instructions on how we ought to live. In verse 13 to 16, Jesus speaks about salt and light. Salt is a preservant. It is commonly known and used to preserve meat or food in the times when Jesus was speaking or te Jesus was teaching. So Jesus is then equating salt as a, as a preservant, something that would preserve food and something that the people in that day would know would preserve food. Believers ought to preserve the world of sin and ungodliness. Salt has many other uses, uses from medical to comfort to flavoring. If you watch Come Dine With Me or Master Chef, you would hear the lack of seasoning at times mentioned and salt being the cure of that lack of seasoning. Something bland, something boring can have flavor that brings it alive in the form of salt. So salt also adds flavor. I don't think there was a single mention of lack of seasoning at the eat and run yesterday as we sat around the fire. I believe salt was used as a preservant and it adds flavor. It enhances the flavor of the world. Christians who are living in obedience to God and led by the Holy Spirit should influence the world for God should bring a flavor kind of profile that points to God. Where there is sorrow, believers share the hope found in Christ. That's Matthew 5, verse 4. Where there's conflict, blessed are the peacemakers. Matthew 5, verse 9. Where there's hatred, there should be love. Matthew 5, verse 44. Just in the Sermon on the Mount, we see instances of how Christians should provide the flavor and be the preservance in relation to the world. Before verses 13 of Matthew, we find the Beatitudes. Some say beautiful attitudes, but really blessedness. Blessedness in different areas or spaces of life is brought by having the right attitude of life. A useful one, such as compared to salt. So being salty 
well, not in the Gen Z or Gen X way, but salty as in useful, and, and preserve the right perspective that we ought to have of life. Jesus then speaks about light. I'm a father of two daughters, and it is clear that the absence of light is darkness. I see this clearly if I were to try to dress my youngest and the top of the jersey stays a second too long on the head. There's panic, there's fear, there's darkness. The funny thing is once or twice the jersey is on, the eyes are closed and there's still panic. And I'm not sure why the eyes are closed at this point. But that's what hap- darkness brings. Darkness brings fear, brings chaos. Bad things happen in the darkness. So if you were to ask little kids where the monsters are, they always mention places that are dark, under the bed, in the closet, or when you switch off the light. So Jesus expresses light as who we are, or who we should be. But you should then remember that Jesus is called the true light in John 1. Jesus is the true light. We only are light if we know and are in Jesus, because he is the true light. Same as with salt, it's useful if it is used. The light is useful if it is seen, if it is visible. If the light is under a basket, if it is hidden, then there will be fear, there will be darkness, and the light can't be seen, as we've seen from our text this morning. If you drive to Atrisville, um, a town Pretoria, sort of Pretoria West, there is a tunnel that you might drive through. In this tunnel, it's mostly dark. Um, let's, let's actually say it's dark because there are lights, but they don't actually work. Maybe ESCOM, maybe maintenance, but as you drive through the, the tunnel, as you approach Atridgeville, you see some glimmer of light that becomes bigger and bigger as you approach Atridgeville. So light brings that hope as you're driving through this dark tunnel and you see the light that is there. Jesus expresses light as how Christians should be in the world. The presence of light in a world of darkness should be blinding. People should be able to see the presence of light in a dark world. The truth of God's word brings light to hearts and lives of those who don't know him. The Christians living in obedience and led by the Holy Spirit, doing good works, living like Jesus teaches in the Sermon on the Mount, would, not should, be evident in the world. The world should look at those who are salt and light and ask, what is your hope? Who are you? Why are you different? And our answer can only be that there is true light. Jesus who died and rose again. He is my king or he is our king. Verse 16 importantly gives a reason for us to be salt and light, which is not for us to be glorified, but for the world to give glory to our Father in heaven. When you watch Come Dine With Me, if the food is seasoned well, then the compliments go to the chef. This morning, I could still hear some conversations about the flavoring in food from Eat and Run yesterday. But when people see Christians, they should turn to give God the glory. God, the creator of the universe and all in it, glory and honor and praise be to him. When you come out of that long, dark tunnel, you feel like stopping the car as you're driving towards Atridgeville, like coming out and rejoicing for you see the light. That should be the response to moving from the darkness to the light. Our identity as God's chosen people, our calling is to be different to the world, to add good and positive flavor, not so that people say, Gum nandi la, but people say, Jesu pagame. We ought to shine the light of God to all, to bring glory to God. Some people will only experience and know God through the lens that is you. Are you pointing people to God in how you live? In 1 Peter 2, verse 9 to 17, we find that as Christians, we have an identity as a sojourner. So a sojourner means someone who has temporary residence in a place. So we are sojourners in this fallen and broken world. In the new heaven and earth, we have our permanent residency. But in this world, we have our temporary residency while we wait for the blessed appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are slaves of God as we see in 1 Peter 2, verse 9 to 17. So picture this. 
a scenario where God is portrayed as the ultimate CEO running a divine internship program for aspiring saints. During orientation, the heavenly HR manager, um, maybe Peter, explains welcome to the divine internship program. Here at Heaven Incorporated, we are all about teamwork and service. As slaves of God, you'll be working with Paul, Malachi, and Jeremiah. You'll be assigned to tasks to help spread goodness and light in the world. You will develop the saltiness that is useful and bring flavor and perspective to all of life's challenges to help everybody you come into contact with. But don't worry, we offer an on-the-job training and eternal benefits. And remember, the coffee in the break room is heavenly, maybe like ours here, which is from heavenly coffees. (laughs) So as slaves of God, we are children of God as well. And we have external and eternal benefits as heirs to the kingdom of God. The task that we have is to live in this world, to be salt and light, to proclaim Christ and make much of God. Our second identity is that we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. As a chosen race, as a holy nation, we know the mercies of God who has brought us out from the darkness into the light, out of separation from God, out of hopelessness, and into the light, the marvelous light, into hope, into salvation, into eternity. Our identity, who we are as God's possession, God's children, sojourners and temporary residents in this world. And the call on our lives is God's workmanship, giving glory to God in everything we do, sharing the mercies of God in both word and deed, being salt and light, submitting to the governing structures is pleasing to God as well. So how does salt and light apply to elections? We are in an electioneering season where 52 different parties are all asking for your support. All the parties say we have or they have something different to offer or to do for South Africans. We even have some individual campaigners for both local and national government. Some of us are in information overload but still uncertain if there is a right or wrong decision. Some of us are apathetic and not even sure if we are registered to vote. Doesn't matter if I vote. Doesn't matter if you vote. Why speak about elections, governments, and church? The Bible doesn't directly choose or indicate a political or governing system we should choose. So why participate in elections and the broader community spaces? That's our last point, our third point. Why do we participate in elections and broader community spaces? I want to preamble this with the Bible not having a specific verse or chapter that says vote. However, the Bible being useful for all of life gives us principles in which we can make discerning decisions on everything. I believe the question on participating in elections always has to do with some misconceptions also. I want to look at three misconceptions before I look at why we should vote. The government and leadership from the biblical perspective will show us why we should vote. So first common misconception or first common words is there needs to be a separation between church and state. This is an American concept primarily to prevent the government from exerting formal control over the church. This is to do with preventing government interference in church and church activities or church life. However, this doesn't mean there can't be church people or Christian ideas within government spaces. Christian ideas should bring glory to God. And people who believe in Christ can be and should be in government because that's another walk or space of life. There should be people in government and in all other walks of life who are salt and light, adding flavor and bringing light to where there's darkness. The second misconception is that my vote doesn't matter. I started a painting project among other house renovation projects I went to build a centurion to get paint, and I met met a paint mixologist who was friendly and very helpful. Every time I go to build this, even though I may not be getting paint, he greets me with a smile, wants to help me, even though I know he's only bound to the paint section. 
So this one person's attitude or his continuous attitude, his desire to help and willingness to serve makes a difference. Now I go to the Centurion Builders Warehouse for everything because of one person's actions. He's a fired earth, um, uh, fired earth is a type of paint, brand ambassador, but the, he doesn't change even if I start speaking about other types of paint. If I ask about Plascon or Dulux, he still treats the same way. He's got the same positive attitude and still remembers me every time I walk through the doors. The truth is, your light, your voice, your decisions matter. You can change things for others around you every day by how you live and what you do. So in the same way, your vote matters. You should vote as if your vote decides who wins. You should be responsible in how you vote. The last misconception I want to speak about is God chooses presidents, therefore I can't affect the outcome of the elections. I think at times when we approach elections, we see presidents as kings, but in fact, we should think about them as servants, as Josie mentioned as they responded to question of the day. This is because the president should be governed by the constitution, should be accountable to parliament, should have the checks and balances of the judiciary. So the president isn't autocratic. Autocratic meaning absolutely powerful and able to act without the opinions or voice of others. This is why I would not want to see Jesus as president, because he's king, all-knowing and powerful, acting in a way that would be best for all. He can't be removed. He can't be recalled. He doesn't have to contend with sharing power and negotiating between building a fire pool or a swimming pool. The president is elected and serves at the call of the people. Actually, we, the public, are the autocracy as we approach the voting stations. So the outcome of the elections is to place someone who is servant-hearted in nature, who can be president and function within the mandate of the people and the mandate of the Constitution. Yes, God's will supersedes every aspect of life. What God has purposed will come to pass. Elections and governments in power is merely a method in which God uses for his will. Even, they are bad, even if they are bad leaders in place, God is working all things out for the good of those who know him. That's what Romans 8.28 says. God's will will supersede every aspect of life and isn't an excuse to abdicate our responsibility as Christians where God has placed us. If you choose to never change the brakes of your car, if you choose to never bath, if you choose to not fix your leaking roof, God will still be king and his will will still be accomplished even in your choices. His name will still be glorified. So please change the brakes, bath, and fix the leaking roof. <laughs> so neglecting our responsibility as adults does not stop God's will. Changing the brakes of your car, bathing regularly and fixing the leak on your roof is being a good steward of what God has entrusted to you. And it also gives glory to God. So your single vote is important. It helps you participate in God's will coming to pass. It enables you to be salt and light. Not voting is neglecting your responsibility to be salt and light in the space of governments and elections and leadership. It's ne neglecting your role of obedience and culture We'll come back to this point of culture. So why vote then if these misconceptions aren't true? The IEC, the Independent Electoral Commission of South Africa says because of seven reasons. The first one is because you can. Elections have consequences. Not voting is giving up your voice. It's your money. Democracy needs you. Voting is an opportunity for change. Some of these are helpful, but what does the Bible actually say? I think the first reason is engagement. As Christians, we don't have the luxury to disengage. We are called to engage the world, to engage culture, and to be salt and light. Jeremiah 29 verse 5 to 7 says, 
Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Find wives for yourselves and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters to men in marriage so that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there, do not decrease. Pursue the well-being of the city I have deported you to. Pray to the Lord on its behalf. For when it thrives, you will thrive. So Jeremiah is calling on the Israelites to engage culture, to connect in the cultural spaces, the societal spaces. It's calling them to be different, to pray, or to have a prayer culture, and to promote that prayer culture where God has placed them. Only in engaging the culture can we be salt and light, church. In voting, we're engaging the culture. We've been good stewards of the right to vote we have and to give glory to God in engaging culture well, is to vote well. So being disengaged could not be could be could be not knowing who to vote for, not knowing if you're registered to vote, and or not knowing if you have the right voting district linked to you. Then engaging culture is getting up. It's checking if you're registered and there are easy ways to do that. It's getting a form from the IEC to change your voting district if you have not done so. It's to participate and to engage in the elections, to read the different manifestos, to see what the different parties or individuals stand for. There are easy and unbiased places where you can find this information. News 24 has content. It's got a manifesto meter and more. If you want to know more about this topic, come next week. It will be a week where we'll just dig a little bit deeper into the different spaces in which we can think about how to vote. So calling, we are called to be salt and light. We are called to bring glory to God. Salt and light in voting means not just voting for the lesser of two evils, but we shouldn't just vote for the lesser of two evils or we, sh we shouldn't just look to vote for some smaller party to dilute the vote. We need to get up, do some homework, find out what options are there, and then vote responsibly. Vote as if our vote is the one that decides who will be president. Our calling is to be salt and light, even in voting. So the first one is engage, second one is our calling, and the third one is duty. We have a duty to government and leadership. Voting is a part of that duty as a voice and as an individual who works in the selection of that leadership. Part of our duty is obedience to leadership as well. So Romans 13 speaks about what our posture should be towards governments. Let everyone submit to the governing authorities, since there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are instituted by God. So then the one who resists the authority is opposing God's command, and those who oppose it will bring judgment on themselves. So part of being salt and light is obeying God's command. We ought to submit to governing authorities because they are ultimately instituted by God. We are commanded to pray for our leaders as well as part of that duty. So we don't just vote and sit back and disengage. We stay engaged. We pray for the leaders. 1 Timothy 2 verses 1 to 4 says, First of all then, I urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those who are in authority so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. This is good and it pleases God our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. We ought to pick or vote for leaders that will lead well and have Christian values and ethics. 1 Samuel 12, verse 13 to 25. This is not an easy task. It's not simply looking for a Christian from the 52 hopeful parties. We live in a world where 80% of the people or the population is Christian. And if this were actually true, our world would be fundamentally different. So a Christian party can, can be Christian only in name, like the 80% of the people of the population who call themselves Christian. So we need to read their manifesto. We need to understand what exactly they stand for, even if they call themselves Christian what they hope to achieve, and we need to determine if we think it's possible to achieve that. So we need to get up and learn more about the people who we want to vote or who the, who vote for, the people who we want to lead. And we need to pray that God, through his Holy Spirit, gives us wisdom 
to choose wisely. If you want to know which principles to compare party to, think about what they say about life, about family, about marriage, about children and faith. Why we vote can be found in engaging culture, our calling and duty. We should remember two dangers. The church's role and purpose is not political activism. We will not likely be able to change the world through political policy or legislation. But as a church, we can change the world by proclaiming Christ so hearts are changed. That's the role of the church. So no political legislation or activism can change the hearts of people and transform people to follow Christ. Only proclaiming Christ crucified and being salt and light can do that. Second danger is thinking that an individual or government can save us. If we put our hope in an individual to save the country, then we will be disappointed. We should know that only God can save us, and he has already done that through Jesus. We're living in a world that is not our own as we wait for the new heaven and earth that will be ushered in by the return of Jesus. So the individual or parties we vote for are led by people, and they will disappoint us at times. But we pray for them, we entrust them to God, and we stay engaged. As we close, we should remember what is true. What is truth and remains true is that God is sovereign, meaning all-powerful, supreme, and all-knowing. He is in control, but it doesn't mean that we sit back and do nothing to further the will of God. So the most basic answer of what we are called to do is to be salt and light in the world, to engage culture, to proclaim Christ, and to bring Christ glory because of what Christ has done for us and redeeming us to himself. This is not a salvation by works comment, but rather appreciation of who gave his life freely for us. And in response to that, we should live a life that's honoring to God. This truth should help us in all or any decisions that we need to make about life. This gives us the ability to discern what we should do when faced with normal decisions in this world. We should engage culture. We should remember the calling to be salt and light. We should ask for wisdom and do the work to learn and understand who and why we are voting for. We should vote to further the will of God through government and to bring glory to God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are Lord, you are God, and that you are in control. We thank you that we can trust you and know that in all things that you continue to work things out for the good of those who love you. We thank you for Jesus who died on the cross for our sins and gives us life. In and through his death, we are chosen, we are adopted, and we're part of your children. We thank you that your calling us to be salt and light, to engage culture, is through the help of the Holy Spirit. We thank you that we can ask the Holy Spirit to continually help us to be salt and light. The Holy Spirit to continually help us to engage culture, to be discerning, to be wise. And we know that as we pray that the Holy Spirit would enable and help us. We pray for the elections that are coming up. We pray that you would enable us to discern who and why we would be voting we pray that you'll help us to take this seriously and to remember that this is part of us engaging culture. This is part of us being salt and light. This is part of our duty to both pray for, engage, and sit under the authorities. So would you grant us much wisdom? Would this be a peaceful time of voting? Would this be a peaceful time of electioneering and as we draw closer and closer would you speak to us through your Holy Spirit as we engage the different spaces to learn more about the people that desire to govern this country we thank you that you know that you are in control 
that you're God, that you're sovereign, and that you're in control, and that we can trust you and we know you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.